Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aditi Ghag. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Isovalium. And I wanted to discuss two topics uh, that will help us address and simplify some of the use cases in Cilium. Uh, so I wanted to propose some extensions to the uh, BPF infrastructure and get early feedback. So the first topic is uh, having a network namespace unaware BPF socket situator. Uh, yeah, the title is pretty self-explanatory, uh, but for Cilium, uh, here is a quick refresher why we need it. Uh, so I presented this topic at Plumbers Conference last year, uh, where Cilium needs to iterate over host-wide sockets across all network namespaces, including the host network namespace, and filter uh, client sockets that could be connected to deleted service packets. Uh, and <clears throat> in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over to the implementation details. Uh, but yeah, with the uh, iterator, we plan to invoke this new kfunk that we are adding, which is the BPF sock destroy, uh, and then kill, fil kill the filtered sockets. So uh, I've added a snippet of how uh, the kernel, uh, the TCP and UDP socket iterator match network namespace. Uh, so as you can see, the highlighted uh, section in the code uh, snippet, uh, it will only, if a user needs to iterate over all sockets in the network namespaces, then user will have to enter every network namespace and uh, retrieve the data. So as you can imagine, uh, this is very inefficient, uh, if, uh, especially when you have a single host-wide sockets hash table. Uh, I believe there is this new uh, alternative that was added recently where socket uh, hash tables can be network namespace, uh, per network namespace, but that's not the default option right now. So uh, I have a proposal, uh, as you can see on the left, uh, we would need to over, uh, allow this override option to end users. Uh, so I've listed two options, one is we can just uh, allow users to iterate over all sockets um, in the host network namespace only. And the second option is uh, if, if, a, if an, a user space agent or, or in a, uh, if a user has syscap net permissions, uh, then we allow that user to iterate over uh, host-wide sockets. Uh, so the for the first option, uh, however, it won't work for nested environments. So imagine like Kubernetes and uh, Docker kind of environments, which are which is known as kind for short, where the Kubernetes host are deployed in containers. And then on top, you have uh, other application containers. So Cilium is one of the application containers. So uh, what happens in, in these network nested environments is that the host network namespace is the underlying host. And then Cilium, when it's running in the host network namespace, it's not actually the base host network namespace, but it's like the container network namespace. I don't know if, I'm, if that makes sense. No, yes. Yeah, I'll just repeat what Joe said. It's like each Kubernetes node uh, is deployed in a separate container. And uh, with regard to uh, exposing a flag to user, uh, uh, having a, uh, a new field in the BPF iterator attach app uh, is a good starting point. So currently, the BPF iterator link info struct has uh, these parameters, as they call it, uh, for various iterable resources like map, C groups, task. So we could extend this uh, one for uh, the socket iterators. Uh, either we could call it the socket, or it would be a separate target for TCP and UDP. So any any comments so far? So as far as I understand, we don't have the socket iterator yet, right? Uh, we do have socket iterators. It's for TCP and UDP. It's just that it, it 
it has this network namespaces checks here. How is the UPI looking like? Like, can we just like repurpose? Like, do we have like a net NS FD ID or whatever specified as a parameter? Not yet. Can we add it to like the existing one? Like, why do we need a new one? I guess. Like, do we need a new iterator type, or like we can extend the existing one? This is not adding, as far as I know, this is not adding a new iterator type. It's just adding a new flag mm -hmm. uh, that can allow users to specify this global flag. Yeah, so I'm just thinking like that bool global is kind of like very single purpose. And like if you can just repurpose it to be like a net NS, whatever the ID for net NS, then like you can specify that like let's say minus one will mean like my own current net NS. Zero would mean global or like vice versa, right? And then like you could actually specify any net NS if you have enough permissions, then you can iterate it, right? Like then it will sure. be a little bit more generic. That like is an option. seems to be like too binary basically. I, we are probably on the same page. It's just like how we expose this to this option to users. Um, question. So if I set the global to true, what does it mean? It means I want to iterate all the level M space, and then for each level M space, I want to iterate all the socket. Correct, yes. So maybe a question more for Andre. Andre, I think. There's an existing iter called task file, right? So it, it's like it iterate all the tasks and iterate all the file under the task. So do you think it is something similar here? We want to iterate all the level M space, and then for each level M space, we want to iterate all the socket under each level M space. Yeah, I think what you're uh, referring to is the uh, is the option where. Uh, Kernel maintains sockets for every network namespace, right? By I default, there is just one global. I guess it depends how you want to think about this, right? So like for task iterator, for like or task VMA, for example, or task file, let's say. Let's, let's say task file that's more natural, right? Like you have, the idea is that like you're iterating over all tasks and all the files within tasks, right? Like so your input is like two, two pointers, task and like with the file, right? And then you can have ability to parameterize it and say like I only want to iterate files from like single task. So we can do it here probably, right? Like you can say I iterate over all network namespaces and sockets within them. And then you can parameterize to like only one specific uh, network namespace. Would that make sense? Because if we, if we do a socket iterator, then the natural thing would be like we iterate over all sockets potentially within like just namespace, and then you can parameterize it to iterate only one socket basically, which would be basically a socket lookup, right? So I, I don't know, like it's a question to networking folks, like what feels more natural. But isn't that the default right now? So let's take an example of task resource. Uh, the way it works, the default is that you, you'll be able to iterate over all tasks on a host, and then you can parameterize saying that, hey, I want to iterate over only a specific task. Uh, with regard to the TCP and UDP target, though, they have started, they, the order is a bit reversed. By default, it's network namespace aware, and then we want to make it global. So you already have the option of like parameterizing it. Yeah, I'm trying to look up the UAPI because I don't know this, but I mean, it's still a parameter. I'm just saying that like bool seems like a little bit too limiting. Sure. But l let me look up the UAPI and we can talk. I think there's a question in the back. First, Joe. Yeah, uh, uh, thinking about the kind of nested case, um, I'm just sort of wondering about uh, Rather than sort of global, which kind of assumes like either you're iterating the like everything on the node, um, would it make more sense to? It's basically the current namespace and below. Like if you think of it as a tree, then you're iterating like the current namespace and then like any any sockets in, I guess nested network namespaces. I don't know if there is such a relationship. Okay. Yeah, it's either host network namespace or. Not so, so one of the reasons I or not. Yeah. So one of the reasons I bring this up is in the kind of in the kind case, we may have Cilium running in a contain in like multiple containers. So each of those is like a, I guess it's a network namespace. Under that, we run Docker containers inside. <laughs> this is mostly for a testing scenario, um, but the point being that Cilium agent is running multiple times on the system. So each one of those would be iterating the sockets. And it needs to kind of be aware of like what's for its own kind of 
container. And, and I know I'm like blurring things here because yeah, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping of like container and network namespace, but there's, there's sort of this nesting property from the container side that feels like it would be nice if the Cilium agent isn't iterating everything else from every other kind of node in the simulated cluster. Oh, and, and you can have multiple clusters like this as well. So multi-cluster, I guess it's one more layer of nesting. The C group has a mode, right? Like uh, pre, based on the pre-order and uh, based on the tree post-order, all these things. And uh, if you would like to traverse a nested, and you can use the same approach. But if you want to have a mode like uh, traverse everything and uh, in the system, uh, well, that's possible. And use a task and uh, try to traverse all the tasks uh, from the start of the uh, IDR. I think that's also possible, be depending on your use case. Yeah, but uh, I just wanted to quickly address your last point, uh, being able to iterate over tasks and then uh, iterate over ha uh, hash tables. Uh, oh, excuse so me. Going back to this, uh, our main use case is being able to invoke this KFunk, which is a BPF SOC destroyer, and it can only be invoked from the TCP and UDP iterator program types at this point. Uh, I have a question about uh, about uh, the global flag. I mean, uh, the default behavior is. Uh, will iterate all the socket in the current namespace. Is that the current default? So yeah, exactly. But uh, in the other way, maybe the f uh, when you out of the container, you want the to specify us uh, to iterate uh, on specific names, uh, network namespace. So yeah, the second option that you mentioned is the default right now. Default, but there isn't only for you or current. Current network name Yeah, spaces. but uh, if you also have a container, for example, and uh, you wanted to specify, I wanted, I have a uh, several container and a different namespace, and I wanted to travel, iterate over the socket or other specific uh, namespace. Or yeah, like then you'll enter the network namespace of oh, interest. Oh, you need to enter that the network yeah, space. and then run oh, the iterator okay. program. Mm -hmm. Thanks. There's actually n no such thing as a ID to NetNS lookup today, right? So you would still have to go to all the network namespaces, check the IDs, and only then if it matters. I mean, it's still better than... You, so you have the network namespace cookie, which is global and unique. Uh, I think there's also an ID internally for network namespaces, but... That's an ID, but there's no such thing for lookup function. You cannot look it up. But th there's no mapping from kernel space to user space. Uh, it was just because the, the network namespace not having any way to look it up is just generally problematic. Like across like all observation tools, like right now, we what we do on on the sort of Tetragon side is we like dig up the file. We're like, if we have a file, <laughs> we know this is the network namespace, so we'll just give it this ID, right? Like there's. Like you have to convince Eric Biederman, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's the. I thought that's a that's a that link interface or something to assign ID already, right? No, uh, ID or cookie, but that's from the lat link. I think there's some way to read the ID. Of so yeah, there's definitely a helper in VPF, right, to get it. But then there's something at setsocop or getsocop to read it. Uh, this is a recent thing, right? And that's it. If I remember correctly, the idea has to be, the admin has to assign it. I don't know what is the command or something, no? So it's, it's automatically generated. If Either way, if it's not automatically generated, we can like enforce it to be generated an ID or something. 
I remember it's added to an IDR tree or something like that. In the, it just, I mean, what we would probably want on our side would be a map from cookie to namespace, right? So that we can always get to a namespace. Um, I guess we could build it with like a network namespace iterator and like build it ourselves, but um, that would be one option. So yeah, this helps us too, uh, because we can record the network namespace cookie in the socket uh, like C group program and then iterate over only the filtered network namespaces that you want to kill sockets in. So, so how about this to not like design us into the corner, right? We can make this enum, like U32. By default, zero means current na network namespace. Then you add another enum value, which means like all the namespaces. And then eventually, once we have some identifier for the na network namespace, we add it as another argument, and then like the, the enum will be like specific namespace, right? Sure, yeah. Because, yeah. That's reasonable. Sorry, maybe I missed this, but can we use a file descriptor to the namespace as the argument? You can, sorry? Client says that's the default. But I mean, default is the current names, network namespace, yeah. S but there, I, I don't think you have a file descriptor to an, hmm. Can you get a file descript like FD to any network namespace if you are like a sufficiently sysadmin, yeah. right? So then like this file descriptor is an input argument and you just default like zero to mean current namespace as a special case similar like what we do with PID and then like you can also default it to like minus one to mean any or whatever, right? Then like maybe we don't need enum, we just need like this FD with like two special values. So how is the FD? value different from an enum? Or just FD? Because just it, it can express one? any user namespace if you got the file descriptor to it. Like if you are some tool from like root namespace or whatever and just want to go over sockets within some specific container without like entering into that user namespace, um, network namespace and stuff mm -hmm. like this, then you'll be able to do it. I guess it's just like kind of more universal API. I think the name FD is tripping me. Is it just like, sh should we call it NetNS or? NetNS FD, yeah. Uh, so, the, so the idea is that if you if you look into proc, every every process will have like a directory in it. Yeah. And in that directory, you can find all the na namespaces that this program is part of. And right. then there's also like a file that's like the NetNS namespace. You can open that file and that gives you a file descriptor. And passing this file descriptor to the kernel can al allows you to identify this is the file, this is the network namespace that I'm interested in by passing something that looks like a file. It's just something, a way that you use to track like resources on from, from user space basically. And the, the idea being like if you want to have a specific, like you want to look at the Cilium kind network namespace, you would have to find the you know, the, the right PID, you would have to open the network namespace in that, and you pass that to the iterator to say, this is what I'm interested in. And then you have the semantics that uh, Andre mentioned, which is like, if you have a value of zero, kind of we say that means the, the current one, right, for your, your own process, or minus one being like any namespace. So the kernel enum plus FD is, is cool. So like enum and then like FD together probably is cleaner. And like zero, you default to like to current behavior like with all the zeros, right? So like enum zero will be current namespace, fd okay. zero means current namespace fd, and then you can specify specific uh, namespace or like a separate enum like saying everything. And then like the file descriptor should be zero probably as well then. So just to summarize, uh, I think we agree that it's beneficial to have like a global network namespace socket iterator. Uh, with respect to the API, uh, Andre proposed that we have an enum to indicate whether, whether when the value is set to zero, it would mean current network namespace. When it's set to one, it would mean all network namespaces. And in between, we currently don't have any option to pass that value, right? Because there's no like user space to kernel mapping. 
Okay. So I, I think uh, it has to be an enum, right? Because zero is a valid FD, and we use negative one to mean current in other in other uh, So technically, you're correct. The zero is a valid file descriptor, but the ship the ship has sailed long ago, and the BPF UIPI treats zero as invalid. And so, like the the libppf and like the Scylla VBF library have code that basically says if the kernel gives you a zero file descriptor, we dupe it so that it becomes non-zero. So for the purpose of this discussion, zero is like an invalid file descriptor. Is the file descriptor the better option or the inode? The inodes get reused for, yes. That happens, I think it happens fairly quickly as well. Like if you destroy a network namespace and recreate it, then it ends up using the same inode, I think. Maybe it's not. I mean, in BPF, QAPI, like file descriptor is the usual like identifier for something. Sometimes ID, like for, for prog ID and stuff like this, but usually it's file descriptor. So it's consistent. Uh, second topic as well? Or? Sure, yeah, just to close the loop on this, uh, so I guess once we have plugged in the new file descriptor and this idling info, we can plumb it down to the init callbacks through this iter aux info struct that, that stores this additional extensible information. I have one question on, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, here, so assume we I want assume that I want to like um, iterate all the level namespace, right? So, so the BPI program will want to filter by level namespace, for example. So, here, right now in the kernel is doing the net echo to see whether the pointer is the same. So, how how the BPI program can filter by level namespace? Is it by some ID in the level namespace or? How, for example, I want level M space one, but not level M space two. How can the BPI program filter that? So th that, that's the part that's not clear to me. Uh, I mean, is how we can map FD to this network namespace that kernel understands. But but couldn't we pass like a pointer in there and then if the pointer is null, we go over all the sockets and if it has a specific value based on, if you retrieve it from a file descriptor, then it's probably somewhere in the private data, I would assume, then we can pass this in here and then have the net in this pointer or? How, how, how to get to the, how the BPI program get to the net in this pointer or any cookie or? Does have the API to do that? I mean, like, if, if we would be uh, passing down a file descriptor, like for the um, for the API that we just discussed, we would have the pointer, right? And otherwise, if you, hmm? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other thing is, if you really want to go over all of them. Yeah, then would would be no. But it's a socket to that, not namespace to that. Oh, kind of. Can, uh, can iterators call other iterators? Like, I mean, the idea would be like to have a net ns iterator that calls into the socket iterator for that net ns, right? How about the new, new for iter? Right well now you have for iter number. I think we have for iter level M space and then for iter. Okay. 
think we can move on to the next topic. Okay, yeah, in the second topic, I wanted to discuss uh, some extensions to the DPFC group infrastructure uh, to support environments where you have this containerized workloads. Uh, so just uh, some background to set the stage for uh, further discussion. Uh, starting with socket LB, uh, Cilium, mounts C group V2 uh, FS, uh, and then attaches this a set of uh, program type C group SOC adder uh, at the C group root, and I've highlighted the C group root uh, because Cilium needs to be able to uh, support socket-based load balancing for connections that originate in the host network namespace. Uh, so the tricky part is that uh, in the uh, C group uh, hooks, we don't have access to the source IP and port, or, or rather the source IP and port fields are not populated when our programs are executed. So uh, some new ca uh, use cases have come up recently where we need fine-grained traffic control uh, at the C group layer. And since we ca cannot identify uh, our parts, it's difficult to support use cases. Like, for example, we want to selectively skip socket LB for certain parts, but not the others or policy enforcement where we want to say, hey, pod A can talk to pod B, or something like that. And the uh, last use case is tracing. So when the BPF SOC programs are executed, uh, it does the socket-based load balancing where it translates service VIP to service backend IP addresses. So we generate these uh, tracing events and send them to user space. And then user space need to attribute these events to uh, the corresponding pods that generated these events. So I've, so I've sketch, uh, sketched up a, a high-level overview of uh, the interaction between data plane and control plane. Uh, so since we use C group V2 uh, uh, FS, uh, we can use C group ID as the shared context between control and data plane. So in the user space, we have the Cilium agent running that receives these events from Kubernetes control plane. Uh, so when pods are started, uh, it, it maintains uh, the C group IDs and C group paths for these pods and co uh, the containers that run within pod. So pod is just a set of containers, and these containers share network namespace. Uh, in the data plane, we uh, use uh, this uh, existing helpers to retrieve C group ID. So the first one is uh, when you can get the current C group ID, which is the ID that belongs to the current path. So in our, in our case, it's the container C group ID. Uh, the second helper that's available is the ancestor group ID, where, as you can imagine, uh, you can specify the ancestor level. So ancestor being a C group that's higher up as, as compared to the current path. And so when for example, for our tracing use case, what we are currently doing is uh, in, the, uh, in the BPFC group programs, we stamp events with the C group ID and then send this to the user space via ring buffer. And then user space can then attribute these events to the corresponding pods or containers. So uh, the problems that we have is that in Kubernetes, uh, C group hierarchies are not consistent. So I've, I've added snippets for uh, example uh, C group paths here, and I've highlight, highlighted some of the fields that vary between these paths. So the way Kubernetes constructs uh, C group hierarchies is using this variable uh, fields like pod, uh, QS, or its ID, or container ID, and so on and so forth. And all, all these fields are encoded in, in the C group uh, path for a pod. So uh, we, we currently don't have a reliable way of getting pod or C group paths. So we discussed this issue with uh, uh, upstream Kubernetes. And what they recommended is that container runtimes can pass this pod C group paths to uh, CNIs like Cilium. So with this, we have a uh, way 
to get par C group paths um, in the control plane. However, we still need to address this issue in the data plane, uh, and let's see why. So the uh, BPF get current ancestor C group ID expects an ancestor level, uh, and this is what the description reads. Now the tricky thing is this ancestor level is computed with respect to the root. So let's go back to this uh, example C group path. So as you can see in the first one, the ancestor level uh, with respect to the root is one, two, three, four. So if you just compute it with respect to the root, it's one, two, and three. Uh, it's one and two. But if you see the second uh, path, it's one, two. Uh, it's, it's just one. And that's because the way Kubernetes encodes certain QoS fields for certain parts and not the others. So this is what uh, makes it difficult for us to use this API. Uh, so when I looked at this API first, my intuition was that it expects the ancestral level computed with respect to the current task, but that's not the case here. Uh, so before talking about the proposal, uh, the alternative we considered is using uh, C group local storage. Uh, but the uh, caveat there is that local storage is associated with the corresponding C group hierarchy. So in our case, since we attach BPF C group programs at the root level, the local storage is as associated where the BPF C group programs are attached and not at the P group, uh, the, excuse me, part C group path. So, uh, the proposal I had was to be able to allow ancestor levels computed from the current task. So when operating at the container level, we just say, hey, I need C group ID for the pod, which is just one level up uh, the current task. So here are some uh, options. We could just extend the existing helper uh, that, could ex uh, that, that could take negative levels to indicate that user needs uh, ancestor uh, is asking for C group IDs uh, with respect to the current task and not the root. Or introduce a new KFUNG that deduces some of this functionality but also allows for uh, different types of ancestral levels. Or the final option is maybe we can just get the current hierarchy level for, for the task and then the BPF program can compute whatever C group ID ancestor level that it needs the C group ID for. Any comments? So the current behavior is like when you pass, what, zero or one, you get actually the root C group? Uh, when you pass zero, it's the re uh, root C group, yes. Okay, I mean, negative makes sense to me. Seems simple and natural. Okay, yeah. I agree, uh, it's just that if we extend the existing helper, how do we determine whether the current kernel is supporting the new API or the, exi uh, the old one? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think that could, could work. Like you don't even have to like feature detect, you can detect it at runtime, right? Like you sure. just run the same uh, helper, it returns you probably E and Val on old kernels and yeah. like something meaningful on the new kernels, right? So Yeah, it's a one time thing. Yeah. Uh, we could also use that. <laughs> I guess the only complication was this runtime run check is if you pass minus one and you need to make sure that you have at least one parent, right, too. Because otherwise, if you're in the root, you're doing minus one, there is no parent of the root, and it's natural to return an error, I guess. But yeah. There can be a different error value depending on whether this is supported or not. What would what you described could work in C group namespaces? I mean, it makes total sense, right? So, like on the new kernel, if there is no C group, that should be E no end. 
So like minus one and you don't have a parency group, then it's E no and, it's not E in val. Okay, I'll, I'll need to check the code. Uh, yeah, basically right now, if it cannot find find the ancestor, just return zero. I guess we can return some new error code, or or maybe not. Right? If it's if it's zero, it's too late. So what does it return when there is an error? Oh yeah, we okay. That explains it. Okay, so what about option three? I mean, if it returns C group ID, right? So FFF could be a valid C group ID. It's a 64 bit. So it's possible. It's a valid C group ID. I don't know how to generate it, but it's a 64 bit ID. I mean, to repeat, yeah, the higher 32 bits are generation, lower is IDR. So, yeah, you can overflow into FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
it's subjective. I think negative is a little bit confusing if you want to do like a relative, but yeah, I, I think if, if we wanted to add it somewhere, we could just add it to the current K func and it should be fine you know, if, if people think it's useful. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.